Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Again, we welcome you, Tim and Grace and Chandan. Glad you are with us this afternoon. Um, it's, so this is our fourth week uh, since we started the study of first epistle of John. So we are now <clears throat> in First John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11 before us this afternoon. Just to remind you of the theme, um, John writes in order to remind the three basics of Christian life, which are sound doctrine, obedient living, and fervent devotion. And the purpose of John writing this letter, as we have seen, to rebuke false teachers and to refute their false uh, teachings, uh, primarily, um, you know, those coming out of Gnosticism, they denied the eternality of Jesus Christ. They agreed, sure, Jesus is above angels, but he is, since he is the Son of God, he is less than the Father God. The second false teaching is the doctrine of origin of sin and eternal damnation. They claim the spiritual and the physical cannot coexist. But Jesus, as we know, he is fully God and fully man. And in fact, those who trust in him has his spirit inside of each of you. Amen? That's the second one. The third one is, to them the salvation is some additional revelation rather than simple trust and belief in Christ, what he has done on the cross for their sins. And so since they seem to possess the special revelation, they tend to put themselves higher than the rest, and so there is no loving one another. They're always looking down on their fellow men and women. So they've been hostile to one another. And John addresses all of these three in his first episode. As we heard from um, Brother Raj last week, the author John is an apostle who writes more and teaches about the love of God. He's the apostle of love. But he's also an apostle of thunder. I think Brother Raj reminded us last week as well. And so as son of thunder, he steps in to denounce these false teachings. And he does it repeatedly throughout the letter, at the same time reminding the love of God and the love of his son, Lord Jesus Christ, who is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Amen. Um, let me read the scripture portion before us. First John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Follow with me on the screen as I read. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let me look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the time that you have given to us thus far. We thank you for your spirit that is within us, among us, in each one of us. We thank you for the way that you, 
Lord, your spirit has inspired me through the opening prayer. It was such heartfelt, straight from you. We thank you, Lord, for using our own, the least of us, to speak through us to encourage each one of us. Lord, we thank you for the variety. We thank you how you have brought each one of us into this small fellowship. And you are continuing to lead us. And so, Lord, I ask your help, the Holy Spirit, to even take us further into this section to hear what you have for us, each one of us. And so, Lord, I pray for myself that you would anoint me and fill me with your spirit, that I may speak what you have given to us with clarity and with boldness and with authority as if it is coming from you. I know I am not qualified in any manner, but such is those who, whom you use if they are willing. And so, Father, I commit myself and the time before us, speak to us, speak through me, and also hide me under the shadow of your cross so that you, your words, your presence alone be felt, received, and ministered to us, to each one of us. Let none of us go leave this place untouched. Help us to evaluate in the light of your word. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The sum and the substance of uh, <clears throat> what John writes to his readers is to explain the character of God's commandments, uh, which the follower of Christ must uphold or live up to it. The theme is all love, as I said before, both in relation to the commandment of God and also how that brings out what is inevitable to hide in the life of a Christ follower. John gives the expected characteristics of true uh, believers in Christ, especially about the love for God and love for one another. Love in action is the theme for us who say we keep his commandments. But also John cleverly points at every step that he says it is possible, if not very easy, to profess to have Christ but not show the evidence. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. And so as we progress along, let us remember that John is writing to the churches in and around Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. He is addressing to the believers who are the followers of Christ. And so these words, this teaching applies to us. And John starts this section with the most loved word. He says, beloved. Except in 3 John 1, where he uses that word as an adjective, rest of all the occurrences of that word in 1 John alone, he uses it as a noun form addressing each one of his readers and to each one of you who are here this afternoon. What a, a way but to address his readers saying, you who are so dear to me, you are so loud. And this seems more appropriate um, you know, to address his readers 
because he's now shifting his focus onto the law commandment. And so thereby he challenges the Christian message, which is to love one another, which is preceded by loving their God. And also highlights that in this world filled with darkness and evil, it is challenging to do so. And so he encourages us. He says, I am writing no new commandment. And he, and like if you read that verse, he doesn't actually say what it is here in this chapter. But if you flip through Second John verses 5 and 6, we see what he means. I'll read it for us. I think it's on the screen. Not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we have heard from the beginning. That we love one another, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Out of the two most common, um, you know, words used for uh, new in Greek, one signifies us that which was not there before, and it has just appeared in time, which we know it as the chronos time, as the time unfolds. But the other significant um, uh, is that this has already been there in the beginning or from the beginning, but it is coming in a newer form, which we call it as kairos, which is God's timing, time beyond, I mean, even before the time began. I think the latter is used for the word here, new, which is in line with John's own explanation as we move along. So the point that John implies for us to catch is this new or old commandment is something very basic to Christianity. It is Christianity 101, foundational Christianity. I mean, we know the words. Jesus himself says, people will know you as Christians because of what? Your love. So what he is teaching to us is so basic, fundamental, in his effort to refute and rebuke the false teachings and false teachers. Moving along, verse 7. I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. He says, meaning it's not new. It's not new. It is of old, but new in nature. I must make a comment on the word heard. The old commandment that you have heard I'm sorry, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word that you have heard. The word heard implies that Christianity is primarily to be heard, to be preached. Christianity is primarily to be heard. It implies that we ought to sit under the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God by faithful teachers. Unless it is taught and preached, Christianity cannot be heard. So this old commandment is the same commandment that they have heard from the beginning of their Christian life. And it has been taught from the beginning. Two verses from Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. We know the Shema of God where we read, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. 
And the second one is in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the old commandment which has been from the beginning, which has been taught to those first uh, century believers. And Jesus, in the New Testament, we see he, he takes these two commandments in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and he connects them to make them inseparable. As he quotes in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, we read, And he said to him, the lawyer who comes and you know, had a conversation with him, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And he said the second one is like unto it in Matthew chapter 22, same chapter, verse 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Did you, um, you know, get to see what Jesus is communicating by combining these two together? He implies that our love for one another flows out based on our love that we have with our God. Unless we are connected in him, we cannot love our own neighbors. I mean, our own family members. Hate comes so naturally within us. Nobody has to teach us. But unless we know the love of God, we cannot love one another. And so Jesus, very brilliantly, he connects both of those two old commandments. And he says, unless you love God, you cannot love one another. So what it means is, if you and I don't love one another, then it means you don't love God enough. If you don't love one another, you don't love God enough. If your love for one another is decreased, then it should imply your love for God is decreased as well. And John writes, you know, I'm not teaching you a new commandment, but an old commandment which was from the beginning, which was in the law, which Christ Jesus also taught, which you heard from the beginning of your Christian life. So moving on to the next verse, verse 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment. Let me stop there. Verse 8 seems to contradict verse 7. He says, no new commandment. But here in verse 8, he says, at the same time, it is a new commandment. And as I said, it is new in its profoundness, in its deepness, and in its vastness. New in its excellence, quality, grade, status, degree, rank, depth, whatever. Jesus lifts that old commandment into a, new, a whole new degree. John chapter 13, verse 34, we read, A new commandment I give to you, Jesus says, that you love one another. How? Not you love yourself. Not like as you love yourself, but he says, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. It's no longer love your neighbor as you love yourself. I mean, we heard that verse preached to us from every place, every which way, when we all had to go through during COVID time, right? People taught us left and right. But now Jesus lifts that command and he says, just as I have loved you you are also to love one another. John 15, 12 says the same thing. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This goes way above and beyond what we were taught from the beginning. Jesus raised the bar or the degree that is impossible for a natural man to live up to it. Unless one is born again, unless one receives forgiveness and repentance, unless one is adopted into his family, be 
ha- have that vibrant relationship with him, he cannot love his neighbor. I mean, I wrote my, you know, to myself, we don't need anyone to teach us how to love ourselves. We take much better care of our own selves. We plan for our future. I mean, everything is covered. Nobody ought to teach us on that. But we are now instructed to love others by the one who demonstrated it on the cross. He's the one who says, as I have loved you. Just to recap, how did Christ love us? I have a few verses. It'll be on the screen. John 13, 1. He says, he loved them till the end, the vastness of his love. John 15, 13. His love is something that he laid down his life for his friends. The depth of his love, you can say. Ephesians 5, 2, Christ loved us and gave himself for us. See the degree of his love. Same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, gave himself up. Reminds me of the song, the love of God is greater for than any tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest Star and reaches to the lowest hill. And the chorus of the song is, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure than the saints and the angels' song. Who can measure the depth and the breadth and the length and the height of his love for us? It is he who says, just as I have loved you, so also you should love one another. Moving along, uh, the second part of verse 8. John writes, which is true in him and in you, he says. In him there refers to Jesus Christ. Sure it is true in him because it is he who has demonstrated it on the cross. But how is that true in you and I, his readers. As Christ followers, we see, we have, uh, you know, seen, uh, we saw that last week in verse 5. As Christ followers, you and I are to keep his word. And when we do so, the ones, you know, in him, truly the love of God is perfected. If we follow him, abide in his word, this commandment will be true in our lives. And with the teaching of this new commandment, we're not told or taught to restrict our love to one another. I mean, there is no bounds. There is no bounds. Who can measure, as I said, length, breadth, height, and depth of Christ's love for each one of us? And so God tells you, do the same. And when you actually put this into practice, not by your own strength, it shows all of your weaknesses. I had a very hard time to introspect, retrospect myself as I was studying this topic. There will be the reality of humiliation, denial of self, sacrifice, and servanthood demonstrated in our lives with one another, especially with those who are tough to deal with. I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us. That reminded me, you know, what Christ said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He says, daily. In other words, die to self 
and so be resurrected into the newness of life, every instant you are put to the test. A few examples I have just to so show how Christ uh, you know, taught his disciples. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. The, uh, this is Peter, you know, he comes to Jesus and says, hey, if my brother, you know, uh, commits a sin against me and how many times I should forgive him? Is it seven times? Is that enough? But then Christ replies, I don't say to you seven times. Since you're asking for a number, 70 times seven. Same thing, Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Jesus says, pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. I mean, I don't have to read all the verses and embarrass myself. Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with brotherly affliction. Outdo one another in showing honor. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Count others more significantly than yourselves. Wow. Less of self and more of others. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, ch chapter 4, verse 2. It says, Bearing with one another in humility and gentleness. And he says, the third part of verse 8, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. We know the age that has to come yet has not arrived, but John says the true light is already shining. And how is it true that the true light is already shining? It must be shining through you and me who proclaim and profess that we have Christ in us, who is love, light and love. If we love one another, I mean, as I said, John is writing these letters to the church members, believers. I mean, we haven't even gone outside of our church. So it's talking about the fellow brother and sister, loving one another. If we do that in the manner Christ has loved us, then the true light is already shining. And when the non-believers see the authenticity of our love with the other believers, they know that we are Christians. And it has powerful effect on them. I want to share an example, but I'll save it for later yeah, <clears throat> when I come to verse 10. And so at this point, I want us to stop and examine ourselves. Take this to the heart. Are we loving one another as taught in the new commandment? In that manner. Am I loving the people who are easy to love? Or am I loving people who are more like me, walk and talk like me, dress like me, so that they can let me be me? Are you reaching out to other brothers and sisters in the community regardless of their ethnicity and economic status? Those are the questions that we must honestly examine and let the Spirit of God convey and convict if there is anything that we need to confess in his presence. Let me go to verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. This is a continuation of those who we have seen in chapter 1, verses 6, verses 8, and verse 10. Verse 6, we see those who claim to have fellowship with God. Verse 8, who claim to have no sin. Verse 10, who claim 
that they have not sinned. And John tells in verse 6, those who claim who have not uh, no fel- uh, to have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, he says. Verse 8, those who claim to have no sin, they deceive themselves and the truth of God is not in them. Verse 10, who claim to have not sinned, they make God as a liar. And the word of God is not in them. And it's continuation of those. And this time their claim is they are in the light. But their actions in hating this fellow brethren speak more louder than just their claims, which are, you know, mere words. I mean, John uses these words, you know, light and darkness, love and hate, to communicate clearly in the, you know, black and white words. I mean, to him, there are no alternatives in between, no intermediary. It's either light or darkness. Either you love or hate. And John implies there is no need for anyone to claim who they are. Because the choice an individual had already made in this regard will become evident in how he or she treats his fellow members. Again, the word whoever refers to those who say whom they are not. So their claims themselves contradict their true identity because of their works. Titus 1.10, we read this, they are empty talkers and deceivers. They profess to know God, but their lives reveal the contrary. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, I have a typo there in my notes, but they deny him by their works. They only profess but lack evidence. Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 19, Jesus himself says, Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Their actions speak louder than their words. Verse 10, whoever loves his brother, John writes, abides in the light. On the contrary to hating one another, the fulfillment of the new commandment is to love your brother. John 13, 34, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. The use of the verb hate sounds so strong. But for John, failure to show love, which, as I have already told you, which is the basic, foundational, 101 Christianity, if you fail at that level, for John, nothing else matters. You hate your brother and sister. Since it is so important it has an edge to evangelism. As I said two weeks back, as we all shared the prayer request of one of our brothers and sisters lost their four-year-old daughter. We all mourned for her uh, as a community. And the day after the long weekend, Memorial Day weekend, we buried uh, the baby. And there were non-Christians there present as well. Especially one family that we frequently ask you to pray for, who Brother Raj meets with them every week, even that family, you know, that brother was there as well. And I heard it from Brother Raj. I mean, he was so shocked, surprised to see how brothers from different communities come, you know, who came together and did everything as the Lord led all of us. Loving one another has that edge. It opens door for evangelism. 
again, loving the brother and sister in the church of God. It has to start with the family of God first. You cannot, you know, do that, display that, leave it out here inside, but go outside and do it. It has to start within. And so to remain or to reside or abide in the light means to adhere to the apostolic eyewitnesses' teaching and testimony, which is, again, these basics that John is covering for us. Adhere to the new command, love one another, walk in the light, shine the character of God who is light, and walk as Christ who set an example to believers. Chapter 2, verse 6. To walk in the same manner or same way in which he walked. Moving on to the second part of verse 10. And in him there is no cause for stumbling, he writes. The one who loves his brother. The idea for John used the stumbling is not to be a stumbling block. When he displays or demonstrates the love of Christ by loving the brother, he will prevent himself from stumbling. Stumbling by what? The false teachings by the false preachers. Those who love one another has no cause for stumbling because he abides in the light. One verse from Psalm, Psalm 119, 165, we read, Those who love your law, nothing can make them stumble. If you follow the commandment of God, if you abide in the word of God and his spirit in you, and you love one another, there is no cause for you to stumble. Many people, as we have heard, they have stumbled. They used to be part of that church family, but they left them and went elsewhere, as John says in chapter 2, which we will study in the next weeks. If you love your brethren as Christ loved you in being obedient to the new commandment, you will have no cause for stumbling. That means that you will continue to be in the sound doctrine and teaching, obedient living, and fervent devotion. Those three basics of Christian life. Because the love of Christ is in you, and your love for him is being perfected as you abide in the truth. Last verse, verse 11. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Pretty strong words. Those words call each and everyone's attention to really look into, you know, put yourself in, in these words to see. Whoever hates his brethren implies he has never come to the light. I mean, how can you, the one who have tasted the love of Christ, who have received the forgiveness of Christ, who you claim to have relationship with him, fellowship with him, claim to be abide in his word, how can you not love your own family member, God's family member, your own brother and sister? John says he continues to live in the darkness. Sadly, they can't see where they are going because they have spiritual blindness. And that blindness is not just one time. They deliberate, deliberately choose to unbelieve what the Word of God teaches. The whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. Unless you have a high view of the Scriptures, you will be looking for some kind of special revelation everywhere. few verses, cross-references. 
John chapter 3, verse 19. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. John 12, 39. They could not believe. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. These are the tares who grow alongside of the wheat. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 13. The wheat and the tares grow together. It's hard for you and I to identify who the tares are. But there's going to be one day where the Lord of the harvest will come and separate the tares from the wheat. And until that time comes, we don't know when you and I have the time to evaluate ourselves in the light of the Word of God. Let His Spirit speak to us, show to us where we needed to ask His forgiveness, where the Spirit of God convicts us, receive the forgiveness, and continue our walk. Like when we live out our lives, we don't have to claim because it's already you know, made manifest. Right? May the help of uh, our living God um, you know, guide us appropriately so that we would heed to his spirit. Again, in closing, the question before us is, how is your love life? Is it in this new commandment way? Re- remember, we are not to love Others, as we love ourselves, the bar has been raised. You are to love one another as Christ loved us. That's the question before us. How is your love life? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day that you have blessed us and the time, this special time, as we gather together, as is our discipline, as is our desire to come together with the family of our Father. How amazingly you brought each one of us and planted us in this church. We are so thankful. Lord, I have no greater words to define and describe the joy that comes to be in the midst of my fellow brothers and sisters. Such is the blessing that you have given to us. Thank you for this time, Lord, where we sang your praises, we sang your word, We remembered you during the communion time. And now even that you have spoke to us in the light of these few verses. We thank you for your spirit that has rightly challenged us. And it will continue to challenge us. And so, Lord, help us that we would not put it on hold, but that we will heed immediately to your still, small voice. Convict us where needed. Lead us into forgiveness that gives us life, more life, that we will be more vigorous, more vibrant, more lively, that we don't have to act, we don't have to claim but just leave it out as you have demonstrated. So continue to work in our lives. Oh Lord, we thank you for you being patient and long-suffering with us. You knew exactly whom you have saved and you have the plan to work with each one of us. You're not going to leave us in between as you have started and so you will finish the work. And so that is our comfort, confidence, and we take 
our consolation in that. Guide us and lead us all through this week until we meet again. We commit ourselves into your hands. Bless the time before us during the fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.